Okay, everyone, we're about to get started. Uh, welcome. You are in Pondering Excellence in Teaching, and this is the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. My name is Javier Hines. I'm the Communications Manager here, and it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Magda Gross. Uh, she's a fairly new addition to CSET, but she's a magnificent one. <laughs> in, so these talks, <laughs> in these talks and at our center, um, one of our major focuses is to really look at and identify persistent problems of practice and teaching. And uh, so we have speakers and we have topics where we really like to delve into that conversation and, and really think about the challenge that it is to both identify those and to really come to some conclusion about them. Uh, so I will let Magda take it away. Uh, we're all very excited to hear her talk, and we'll have thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I had a chance to say hello to almost everybody in the room. So there's a mix of practitioners, researchers, and friends here, and I really appreciate your time on Wednesday night uh, to come and hear about teaching the difficult past in particular in the context of the Holocaust. So today, I'll be trying to answer the question, what makes difficult history actually difficult? Um, and I'll be using a particular case study, which is the Holocaust, education about the Holocaust in Poland. But I do invite you to think more broadly. And while I'm talking, sort of think about your own context or the historical events that are hard for you to teach in the classroom or hard for you to think about, and we'll hopefully zoom out by the end and be able to tackle those, what is this a case of questions more broadly? So um, let me begin. The question of what nations should do to face a difficult history, particularly in the classroom, is sort of one of, I believe, one of the great issues in the post-World War II era, facing um, not just the United States and the countries of Eastern Europe, but also, let's say, Argentina, South Africa, Cambodia, Rwanda, so on and so forth. Um, yet, what exactly are we talking about? For In preparation for this talk, I'm a little bit nervous. I'll warm up, I promise. Um, <laughs> I have to drink a little bit. There's wine out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In preparation for this talk, I tried to look up a language that had this term captured in one word. No. And, and I couldn't find it. Uh, except for in one language. Yeah. Is anybody a German? <laughs> Could you read it, please? Vergangenheit's Bewältigung. And so, ironically, of course, the Germans have one word for this term. Of course, it's a word made up of five other words, but what, uh, the point stands. Um, in most languages, uh, we don't have a word for this. And, and in my understanding, this translation, I've asked a few people, it could be this word could be translated as a struggle to overcome the negatives of the past, or dealing with the negatives of the past, or working over the negatives of the past, or coming, anyway, you get the point. Uh, the variety of possible translations, I think, really indicates the problem that, that we're facing. Um, and just because a language lacks the word doesn't mean it lacks the problematic, of course. And so today, I'll be um, answering three questions in an attempt to define what makes difficult history difficult in the context of the classroom. First, I'll, I'll answer what happens when children actually are asked to face the difficult past. So I'll be giving examples from research. Second, I'll be answering, thinking about the question, when and why should we actually do this? And lastly, I'll be giving you a definition of what I think that it is. And so what I'm trying to propose is, is sort of an orientation towards teaching history that's that on the one that bridges two major themes in the literature and so far, one of which is teaching history as a sort of celebratory enterprise where we teach people to be proud of their nation, and another one to, as a dispassionate enterprise, one where we learn to analyze and respond to texts as a matter of fact. I think difficult history places us somewhere in the middle and really pushes us to think, what is, why are we teaching difficult history? Um, all right. So, as a researcher, I think about, um, I'm going to put on my timer. 
As a researcher, I wonder uh, what shape the past will take in the heads of young people, essentially. What, what shape does the past look like? And most of my work has been about the Holocaust in Poland. And typically, one of the questions I was asked years ago, which led to this, which was, you know, Dr. Gross, isn't all of the Holocaust difficult? To which I answer, yes, of course, in some ways, but also no. I don't think all of teaching all of the Holocaust is difficult. And I think that this lecture will hopefully convince you why. Um, for three years, I worked with and I interviewed uh, hundreds of teachers in Poland. And I worked with hundreds of students in Poland. And um, today I'm going to draw on the analysis of students' responses to just one small part of my research, which is the responses to this photograph. And I asked myself, what happens when school children are faced with a photograph of the difficult past? In this case, the Holocaust. I use a method called photo elicitation. Before I go into what the photograph is, can anybody tell me what they see? Especially somebody who doesn't know or is uncertain about this photograph. Is there anybody uncertain about what it is? <laughs> Does everyone know? OK, what do you see? Yeah? Uh, I'm going to infer um, that is a Jewish man, probably a Hasidic or conservative. And he's surrounded by a German officer, a Kessian, a German soldier, and other people who seem to be civilians. I think, I mean, from what you've said, this is probably set in Poland. And I'm guessing that they are cutting off his lung, mm -hmm. which, of course, is sort of a combination of insulting blasphemy. Yes. Great. So. I want to pause for a moment and say, when I show this to American audiences, especially young children, they often don't know what's going on. In part, because they don't recognize the man in the middle as a Jewish man. They don't have that stereotype, young 12-year-olds, US context 12-year-olds, right? So very good, the man in the middle is, is a Jewish man. This is Poland, it's 1939, which is the beginning of World War II. Just a month after the Nazis occupy Poland, it's October, it's an area probably around Łódź. Um, and what you see is you see German officers, a couple of them. How many German officers are there? I don't think they were officers. I think they were ordinary German soldiers. Ordinary German soldiers. And some Poles. And some Poles. How do you know they're Poles? Well, they're not bearded. It looks like even the person behind, even the people behind, are not Jews. They're not bearded. They have classic university caps. They're basically in a uni Polish university uniform. Um, and notice, too, that for the most part, these are civilians surrounding. And w what is their, is their expression of horror? Are they afraid? Is the woman smiling? Yes. Is the woman smiling? There's a woman smiling. With the baby, she's smiling. I was trying to it out. She's smiling. She is. She's smiling. She's smiling. This woman is smiling. Um, in general, you know, folks are, folks are pretty excited about what's happening here. In fact, once when I asked an American group of teenagers to look at it, they said, maybe it's some kind of a celebration. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a wedding celebration or a family celebration, right, to give you a context. So I want you to remember these smiling faces. And we are going to go into what Polish students saw when they looked at this photo. Importantly, all Polish students knew that this was a photograph from Poland. And it is a very common photograph in their cultural imagination, mm -hmm. as well as these university caps are very recognizable to Polish kids as basically a uniform of Polish students. So um, it's sort of, you could, the evidence is there that these are Polish civilians, some German officers, and a Jewish man in the middle. So for those of you who haven't heard me talk before, I do have to step back and give a little bit of a of the context of Poland and why the Holocaust in Poland. It's a very different context than the Holocaust, teaching the Holocaust in the United States. So um, let me bring you to this image. These are images I took uh, from my, myself, well, from the newspaper when I was actually there, and this is also a newspaper photograph. Poland and World War II, Polish identity and World War II identity are inextricably linked. Poles see themselves as the greatest victims of World War II, which in fact 
is that is true. I mean, they had the Soviets on one side and the Nazis on the other. Um, three million Poles who are non-Jewish perished. Um, they also see themselves as the greatest resistance against the Nazis, and also true. In most of occupied Europe, the Polish underground army was, in fact, probably not just the most effective, but the largest resistance army against the Nazis that we, at the very least, know of. And so here you see that both of those sides commemorated. Here, these are Poles um, memorializing the death of Polish POWs at a memorial in Warsaw. And here you see this sort of triumphant narrative of uh, resistance. Folks are dressed in Polish army uniforms. These are probably fairly authentic to the period. And so in a summertime in Poland, you can literally trip over parades to World War II. I mean, you just run into them. There's moments of silence where an entire city will, will be silent to commemorate their dead. And if the photos don't convince you, I find that political cartoons tell us more about the time than anything else. There was a new museum to the Warsaw Uprising built in Poland. So for those of you who know history, it's not the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but the Warsaw Uprising, where the resistance army staged uh, a resistance to essentially the Nazis while the Soviets watched the Poles perish. Um, and the museum, uh, was set up, and, and this was in the local newspaper at the time, and it's a little grandson, I think, talking to his grandmother, that's how I perceive the photo, and he looks up at her and he says, when I grow up, I want to die in the World War II uprising too. So this notion of martyrdom for your nation is uh, intricately tied to Polish identity of who they are. We, we die to protect our nation. While some memories rise to the top. Some, of course, sink to the background. Poland was a nation that was made up of um, minority populations. Uh, there were Ukrainians who lived in Poland, there were Lithuanians, so on and so forth. At one point, a third of Poland's entire urban population was Jewish. So one in three people in this room would have been Jewish in any major Polish city. Uh, so Jews made up a large Polish po portion of the Polish population. Um, this was a photo I took while trying to go to a death camp called Treblinka, which was only a little bit outside of Warsaw, where probably all of Warsaw's Jews perished, pretty much. Uh, they were deported on July 22nd and, uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto at the time, and at the very least we know 250,000 Polish Jews were, were killed in, in Treblinka. Um, not only could I not find the death camp, but the death camp is actually titled Museum of Fight and Martyrdom. Uh, and once, it's changed now, uh, this is eight years ago, but once I got there, um, the term Jew, if there's a, is, starts with a Z in Polish. And so when you go to Treblinka, where only Jewish people perish pretty much, I'm sure there's some exceptions, there's a list of nationalities killed, and the last one was Jewish, right? They did have Polish, of course. Now, that's not untrue. If you count Jewish people as also Polish and also Ukrainian, of course, those, that's an authentic representation of who died there. But there's the sort of, it's, it's a trick in a way, right? You don't necessarily understand what's happening. Um, that Even though this, you can't see this death camp, it's sort of hidden. Um, or, or crumbling in the summer sun, there is a lot of cultural curriculum um, around Polish Jews. And specifically this cultural curriculum what came up about four or five years before I started doing my research when um, some emigre historians wrote uh, books about Polish participation in the Holocaust. So now, uh, Poles are known to have, in some cases, helped their Jewish neighbors, of course, in some cases been bystanders to the Nazis killing their Jewish neighbors, and in many cases as well, actually participated in the plunder and the murder of their Jewish neighbors. For example, my grandfather's brother and his family was burned in a church in a small town. And these books that have been coming out since 2000 have been talking about those kinds of mass murder 
And it kind of shattered Polish national identity. The Poles didn't really know what to do with it. Right? You can imagine the American context similar. We're thinking about civil war and what's going on now. Um, and these blockbuster movies came out, so the kids are, are you know, watching these movies. Uh, one, this uh, was awarded an Academy Award, I believe, and or at least nominated for one. And it's a, a girl who was hidden by a, in in a convent and finds out she's Jewish and goes back to find out what happened to her town and her property. And these are two Polish heartthrobs who decided to play in a movie about two Polish brothers who go back to basically their father died to figure out how to um, use their father's house and sell their father's house in a small town. And it turns out that his father was the head of a lynch mob that burned the town's Jews in a barn. And, and they have to deal with this. Now, their careers were harmed by being in this film. In fact, this is quite a popular magazine you can buy on any stand that has characteristic um, Nazi graffiti that says Jew um, over the face of this sort of Polish heartthrob, and it says Maciej Sur, did he lynch, did he lynch him, um, lynched by his own asking. Uh, and the, inter the uh, article was more about like his career in an interview with him. And then this is a right wing, more right wing newspaper, but still, um, it has the Polish eagle being sunk, and it says, how to ruin Polish memory. Films like Aftermath, Pokłosie, make Polish-Jewish dialogue harder. And I want us to think about this. Does facing the difficult past in our context make it harder for people to talk across difference? That is a major critique and a comment that folks ask me at the end of presentations like this. So that's the Polish context because we're talking about it deeply. But I, I do want you to constantly be thinking, what could this be a case of? Um, so let's go to what question one. What happens when we ask teenagers to face an aspect of the difficult past? Um, here's my photo. So let me give you some findings. When Polish students looked at that image, let me just get to my notes because it's a safety blanket. Um, every, almost 85% of the sample recognized the Jew in the photograph. Again, remember, American students have no idea that bearded people are anything other than hipsters. <laughs> Lots of the students interchangeably either said German or soldier or both. Even though there was a preponderance of civilians, and many of you saw those civilians first, also because you're maybe not a Polish audience, very few of them saw Poles or civilians. Let's look at a characteristic example, and somebody else could read this maybe who's up front. Have you? Sure. I see a man cutting a Jew's beard. There are people around. Among them are soldiers. I think they are Aryans. The Jew has black hair and a beard. The rest look different than him. I think they are cutting the Jews' beard to humiliate him. It was common to gang up on Jews. This shows they were helpless against the tortures of the German army. This, Sim yes, oh, sorry, sorry. Similar situations are shown on many films. So these hundreds of students are exposed to the films, those same newspapers, um, everything that I showed you before, and yet they're faced with a very clear photograph that provides evidence for them to the contrary of the narrative that this student so, right, so in the face of evidence to the contrary, on the whole, Polish students could not see what they didn't know to be true. And not only that, they immediately identified the Jewish man. One of the reasons is because they just see they don't really know Jews. And I'll show a little an example of this later. But these are the examples in textbooks and on the street that they're exposed to. So it was easy for them to identify, oh, Jew, context of World War II, my schema, as we call it, triggers already what is a prescribed memory, and they were only able to see what they had already been taught to be true. In other words, 65% of the sample said something like this. It was common practice to humiliate Jews in World War II. So I'm going to pause before we go to the other 25 to 30% because I know you're wondering about them and they do face the, um, you know, they're sort of the crux of my talk. I wanted to say one, one extra thing. So Susan Sontag has a theory that memory will alter an image according to memory's needs. And so I'm building on this idea that they, 
the students typically can, are, are basically confirmation bias. All right, um, so why face, when and why face the difficult path? This is where I'm going to read a little bit because I've, I've um, thought this through and I want to make sure I get everything out. So until fairly recently, remembering nasty parts of national past has been considered unpatriotic. Uh, and I'm quoting now from Timothy Gardnash. Just two days after the murder of Caesar, Cicero declared that all memory of the murderous discord should be consigned to eternal oblivion. European peace treaties called specifically for an act of forgetting, and the English Civil War ended with an act of indemnity and oblivion, end quote. And once even, when I was talking to a, a historian who was also a friend of the family, Tony Judd, he said, were it not for a long period of forgetting, many countries in Europe, specifically after World War II, East and West, would have had trouble putting themselves back together as politically stable units. Living a lie can be useful that way. It allowed time for divisions to heal and should not simply provoke scorn or irony. There was a reason. This presupposes the question that we have to ask, when is a good time to face the difficult past? Which I think Judd would probably say, not right away. We have to do it, but not right away. Against this position, I believe it can be argued quite powerfully that delay and suppression have their own psychological and political price. The price that torturers, commandants go unpunished, even go back to high office. Wouldn't this compromise a new regime rather than allow us to heal? Especially compromise democracy in the eyes of those who are set up to in fact be its greatest supporters, those who were liberated and presumably even those who have been marginalized. Or let's propose another question, one that Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa considered a long time ago. What if facing the past right away could uniquely unburden us or enlighten us? In other words, it seems to me, maybe somewhat spiritually, that truth-telling might not only be the most desirable, but the most feasible way to grapple with the difficult past. And let me remind you of something. It is impossible to ignore difficult histories, typically. In the Polish context, I'll give you an example. Um, and so even if, let's say, a nation were to decide to do so, the, si the signs are all around us. For example, the Jeep Cherokee, right? It's an American imperialist sign that reminds us that whites genocided a group that they can name a car after it. Similarly, in Poland, um, everywhere you have uh, the plunder of Jewish gravestones were, was Nazi practice, but it was also those stones were used as building materials. Some have, ex as, have excused it as like poor peasants who didn't have money used it because that's what all but, you know, so this is a, a artist who goes around Poland and finds sandboxes with Jewish gravestones. Now, you can imagine that there's many that are flipped the other way that we'll never know, you know, what was there. Um, this is some kind of a, like, seed grinder he found in a, in a workshop. And again, I, this is not just unique to, this is particular to the context of the Holocaust, of course, but if we think about all the other symbols and ways that um, oppressor groups use marginalized communities, names, the Washington Redskins is an example. It's a football team. Um, or, or like I said, the Jeep Cherokee, these are reminders all the time of what has happened in the past. And that leads me to basically the idea that the, it haunts us. There's a presence of absence, right? So we have, in, in one way, we have to face it because it's there all around us. It's kind of making us almost maybe sick as a society. But um, so let's turn our attention now to uh, hope. Uh, the dissonance, those students that stood out against the rest. These are outliers to, um, to the conundrum we have. So I had about 30% of the sample that was able to all of a sudden see polls. 
Why were they able to? And I would like to note that uh, it's a statistically significant sample of girls who were able to see Polish faces, which I haven't explored. I'd love a partner exploring that. Um, I call it, it a dissonance of incongruity. Yeah, I mean, maybe those are too, too similar. Maybe it's just dissonance. But Anya said, a Jew around whom are standing, so she's just, she's telling what's happening. These are actually written. A Jew around whom are standing German officers, a few civilians among them, a mother with child. It is some kind of a family celebration because everybody is happy. But, hold on, this photo comes from World War II, and actually, it unsettles me. It doesn't fit. It's hard for me to say now what the situation is. So the student who did see the evidence, it didn't upend quite her narrative because she then literally didn't believe didn't know what to make of it, because her schema says, World War II, Germans, Jews, wait, these are, I saw the polls first, what do I do, how do I reconcile this information? For me, as a teacher, this is the hopeful moment. This is the moment we grab, right? I'm going to give another example. In this photograph, I see certainly a Jewish man and soldiers. I wonder, though, why everyone is smiling except for the man in the white shirt. Again, she saw Jewish man. Then she wonders why. I feel that something bad happened after this. As teachers, we grab that moment, right? This is the moment where our students who are not already positioned to believe us or already positioned towards, let's say, fascism or something. These are this is our middle group, our cherished middle group that we want to make sure we change their minds. I'm not exactly sure how yet, which is hopefully the next 10 years in the life. But um, uh, so. Um, this, is, this is where I wanted to evoke Susan Sontag again. So difficult pasts don't fit neatly into the narratives that have become collective memories. Sontag wrote in 2003, describing the effect of iconic photographs of the Spanish Civil War, I think it was, I can't remember now what the photographs were, but anyway, of remembrance in a, in a book called On Photography. She wrote, quote, strictly speaking, there is collective instruction, all memory is individual, irreproducible. It dies with every person. What is called collective memory is not a remembering, but a stipulating that this is important and that this is the story about how it happened. Common ideas of significance trigger predictable thoughts and feelings." End quote. In other words, her distinction between remembering, which is individual, and stipulating, which is social, is important because it implies that collective memory is connected to how we think about schooling and curriculum and teaching in the national context. If we apply what Sontag is saying to students in this sample, these children were collectively instructed to remember the Second World War as only a story of German victimization of Jews, which is why it's so hard for them to understand. In a recent New Yorker article, Elizabeth Colbert stated that new psychological studies found that, quote, conclusions, this is voters, especially voters, uh, poor white voters voting in, against their self-interest, conclusions once formed are remarkably persevering, end quote. The article is a reference to the Trump era of alternative facts or confirmation bias, but for those of us in history education, this is, of course, not new. Indeed, and I'm using a line um, that I think some of you will recognize. A philosopher once said, how can we even ask people to overcome established modes of thought when it is these modes that permit understanding in the first place. So in the case of difficult history, building on previous knowledge seems a hindrance. It's not easy to just create new knowledge. Teaching and learning the difficult past forces us to confront deep and difficult truths. How could someone be both a victim and a perpetrator? How could somebody be both my loving grandmother and have turned a Jew away at the door, whatever? Um, a hero and a villain. How could any of this have ever happened? Who should I condemn? Who am I? These are the kinds of questions that resist simplification but force us to imagine what seems on the surface unimaginable. And it's not just us in this room who might think, um, and children in classrooms who might think some of this is unimaginable and grapple with this. I'm going to quote Jeffrey Hartman. He said, he's an American literary scholar who escaped from Germany as a child. He wrote, quote, disbelief touched the survivors themselves. Two phrases stand out in their testimony. I was there, 
and I cannot believe what my eyes have seen. At the same time, to allow ourselves to fall prey to disbelief on the difficult past now is in some ways letting our enemies win. Primo Levi wrote that at the end of World War II, Nazis turned to prisoners in the camps and said, even if some of you survive, people will say the events you describe are too monstrous to be believed. It seems to me then disbelief is too high price to pay or disregard. So let's look at another photograph quickly to talk about. Um, some of you may be familiar with the scholarship surrounding this photograph, but if not, I'd ask you again to tell me what do you see. And those of you that know, please don't. What do you see? This is a, a very typical photograph. It's a genre. Polish peasants typically, sort of a bucolic genre, they would, at the end of a fall harvest or summer harvest, they would um, stand in front of their crop and take a photo, sometimes with like <coughs> local teachers and policemen and so on and so forth, to show what they were able to reap for the village, essentially. Um, and so this is, is a disquieting photograph because these are Polish uh, peasants. There are some sort of local policemen. They're standing on top of what is probably a mound of ashes, uh, probably at Treblinka, and they are standing in front of um, skulls and bones. Uh, what we think happened in this photograph is that folks were just digging up skulls and bones to, to, because they believed, and I believe it was a myth, that there were still gold teeth stuck in the jaws of Jews who had been gassed at Treblinka. So let's think about the context of why this photo is important in the context of this presentation. Um, this is the middle of Europe after World War II ended. And um, the Europeans captured in this photograph are digging through the remains of Holocaust. What, so what it means to me is it shows that the plunder, let's say, of Jews and Jewish bodies was a kind of a norm, a banality, something you could stand in front of and take a photo of and sort of give it, like, this is our harvest, right? And so taken together, both photographs and the ideas I'm trying to put forth here, the phenomenon of extraordinary things done by ordinary people forces a kind of narrative change. And it's not just for the Holocaust, but overwhelmingly victims of genocide and mass murder have been plundered and killed quite personally and in sometimes in quite banal ways. And so what we think about is in multiple municipalities in Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, men and women of totally good social standing, not necessarily military folks and not necessarily marginal crazy people who slaughtered their neighbors, but men and women of good social standing facilitated and oftentimes directly participated in acts of both murderous violence and plunder against their Jewish friends and neighbors. And that, I believe, is what's difficult about teaching the Holocaust in Poland. To evoke a well-known saying, invoking a million people gassed at Auschwitz is tantamount to quoting a number. At the risk of stating the obvious, what is difficult is that every stage of the Holocaust decisions, individual decisions, had to be made that contributed to it. And of course, I'll ask you now to think of enslavement, terror, lynching, so on and so forth. I mean, there's so many analogous ways we can zoom out and think about this. All right, so why do it if it's so hard and if it upends what we know to be um, so um, let's, let's have this photo up. I want to emphasize that uh, teaching difficult histories punctures what we know to be true. It kind of changes the social shape of the past, and as a result, it often remains with us. Um, but I would like to, uh, I think I had a quote I wanted to state. So consider the premise put forth by William James at the beginning of the 20th century, and I'm, and I'm slowly wrapping up. The greatest enemy of any one of our truths may be the rest of our truth. Difficult histories are, in essence, irreconcilable with what we would like to hear about ourselves. Um, they are events that can be, yet are true at the same time. Or put another way, people committed acts that can't be, yet are true at the same time. These pasts touch how we view ourselves existentially. 
It's difficult because upon encountering it, it changes the stories we tell about ourselves and about our nation. James Young, who's a Holocaust historian, um, said, what if there is nothing positive to learn from genocide? This is something I've thought about a lot. And Tony Judd argues we should set it aside for a little while till we're able to face it. But Wendell Berry says, to be joyful, though we have considered all of the facts. Right? And so perhaps consider that these aha moments that the students had, in just a few minutes, those two girls, was Anya and Barbara, a teacher or new knowledge fractured a deeply ingrained narrative. In just a few minutes, Anya faced a baffling complexity where she learned possibly to be more discerning. She was brought into World War II in ways that other kinds of history and instruction perhaps could not have done. In just a few min minutes, Anya experienced a shift in understanding that changed who she was. And for some of us, that process takes a lifetime. Or it didn't. Um, <laughs> right? There's a social cost. Uh, let me just catch up in the. Um, that's the counter argument. We can't forget that facing the difficult past has an additional difficulty. That to go against what the school, what the family, and what the collective says happened has a cost. And what child, right, could be brave enough to do that? Um, what, what, who in this room has, is brave enough to do that? And so another set of anecdotes come to mind while I wrap this up and I'm moving towards the definition, which was the work that I did with teachers. I worked with Polish teachers who had elected to teach the Holocaust. I decided not to interview those who openly say they won't teach the Holocaust. It wasn't part of my interest at the time. I, I wanted to know why people who chose to, despite the social cost, did. And there, one of this, this kind of, uh, he was sort of like a celebrity Holocaust instructor. He was uh, very well known. He was sort of at every professional development. He said one of the things he remembers is um, a fellow teacher, as he walked up to class in the morning, a fellow teacher leaning outside of the window and saying, none of those Jews today, to him. And a principal saying, we're not going to do up the curriculum in this school. He did leave that school, and he's at a very progressive school in Warsaw now. Uh, but this, I'm, I'm trying to show, really, the social cost of teaching these difficult histories. And when asked why, in face of such personal cost and gaps in knowledge, why did these teachers continue to teach, they would say, my students say, who were they? Where did they come from, these Jews? And the same teacher said, and for me, I remember there was a man in town that remembered there were Jews walking in the square. Then all of a sudden, they disappeared. Remember, this was one third of the urban population, about three million people. Then they were forgotten. The cemetery is in the outskirts. We must show the students that the Jews were here. They create the history in this town. And let me just say for the record um, that Jews resided in Polish lands for close to a millennium and constituted, at the cusp of the Second World War, a third of Poland's urban population. And so if you think about uh, the sort of wiping out or all of a sudden they disappeared, how can the wiping out of an entire minority population be anything other than a central issue in Poland's modern history? In other words, what is Polish history without the Jews? So now I'll close. Uh, I hope I've convinced you in the talk of a kind of working definition. Difficult histories are events or periods that don't fit neatly into what are socially accepted versions of the past. They're not just any violent event. They involve collective violence typically enacted by good people. They rewrite what we know to be, uh, be true about ourselves. They exist around us, and so they brush up against present day concerns and issues. So something can become difficult history and fall out, and vice versa. There's, uh, it often, facing it often comes at a personal and social cost, right? which is often why teachers are scared to teach um, alternative narratives, and they're central. 
to a nation's modern history. And so understanding difficult histories then is key to filling the gaps left out by an accepted story. It seems to me that history class is uniquely equipped to teach children how to fill in these gaps. With good teaching, truth can be found. Maybe not an absolute capital T truth, but a real and important truth. Facing difficult histories allows us to read between the lines and understand our collective past and present. As we look to the future then, I'm going to ask you to consider a quote. Hannah Arendt said, the best that can be achieved is to know precisely what was and to endure this knowledge and then to wait and see what comes of knowing and enduring. Is it possible to go into the difficult past and to come out able to endure and ultimately to make decisions about our lives now that possibly we couldn't have made otherwise? is a great organization that um, has created a lot of uh, curriculum that I think teachers can use. And um, what I'd like to actually do one day is, is use their curriculum with expert teachers to see what kind of moves those teachers do while using that curriculum. Um, and Luke and I are actually writing a grant, hopefully, to be able to do some of this work. Um, their work, as far as I can tell, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, they don't necessarily do the backwards planning. In other words, they get teachers they think are good together to make curriculum for other teachers, as opposed to watch what teachers do in the first place and then see what's needed for students. So it's a teacher-facing curriculum rather than a student outcomes-oriented, to say it simply. I don't think that that's like necessarily 100% true. They <coughs> obviously want student outcomes. Um, but my understanding is that we don't necessarily know what moves teachers are making with it, that curriculum. Is it, is it, did you ask before you did this, I realize it might infect your thing with the photograph, but did you ask before the photograph for the kids to fill out, yeah. for example, what, something about what they understand about choosing from? What is their, what is their view of that right. in general? So I didn't. And I'll tell you a little bit why. They did two major activities with me. One was they wrote the narrative of World War II in Poland to just see if Jews factored in there. I just wanted to know without asking them about Jews, but they write about Jews. And then they had a series of seven photographs of which only some were Polish Jewish. Many were Polish Polish, so to speak. Um, I didn't ask them that question because there's a researcher in Poland that asks that question on big national surveys, like, would you want a Jew to live next to you? You know, what do you, how many Jews do you think died in the war? So some of that research is already out there, and I think it's hard to, if you ask sort of a gendered question, you get a gendered answer, right? So if you ask like a Jude question to a student, you're gonna automatically get a, an answer. And I wasn't necessarily interested in what they thought about Jews, I was more interested in the shape that World War II the path, the shape that the past took in their head. What does that narrative look like? And are Jews organically included or not? But you know, you said you said a large percentage of the students, if not all the students, were able to identify this person in the middle as a Jew. Yeah. If that person did not look like the photographs that you showed afterwards with the old white men with the white beards, I would not be able to I mean, lots of people have beards, but lots of Jews didn't have beards. This urban population that you're talking about, most of, them, I know. most of them were not. But uh, but Polish uh, students don't know that. So if I had shown a photograph of an urban assimilated Jew like my grandfather, yeah. and something happening to him in the midst, they would not have known what it was. Yeah, but you know, this person does not look like those white bearded people. And so I find what's interesting is that they knew that this was a Jew. And that's, you know, to me, that reveals a lot more than what you're saying, because they 
seems to me, no, I don't think they look at all like that, those pictures. This guy, he looks like a guy with a beard, like, you know, he's not wearing a yarmulke, he's not, hat doesn't have curls, and they cut it off already. It doesn't even look like he had them. And he's Just not particularly dressed in any particular way. So I think it's interesting that they knew that that person in the middle was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not telling everything that they know, like Cole's black kids in the South that he interviewed. And after 10 months, he found out that everything that he told them, that, that they told him in the beginning, was absolutely false. Maybe, but then that falsifies my whole talk, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, but, uh, no, but as a person studying opinions and stuff, I mean, who are you? You come into the class, you ask them, who is this person? Yeah. Oh, I didn't ask them, who is this person? Well, they say, talk about the photo. Yeah, I said, talk and about And they were able to identify. I mean, obviously, yeah. can identify German soldiers. That's pretty clear. Anybody can see it. It's very particular to the Polish context because I've done it with American students. They have no idea what's yeah. happening. No, yeah. Yeah. no yeah. idea. Zero. That's what I'm just telling you. That, that's exactly my point. Those kids were able to say that this is a Jew. Your argument is that they look like those pictures, but they don't look like those pictures. It's a conventionalized image of yeah. the Jew in their imagination. It absolutely maps onto, like, for example, I'm going to use an example from one of Sam's studies, the hippie the image of the hippie, you could show lots of different images. They don't have to look exactly like this to be the conventionalized image. You see what I mean? But American kids, if there's a guy that has a band and some hair, even if the hair is a little shorter or the hair is a little longer or there isn't a band but he's going like this with a tie-dye shirt, either orientation they're going to know that it's sort of the conventionalized image of a hippie. And I think that's similar in the Polish imagination. That they can, there's various kinds of but, Jews, but they all have to have beards. But that's, exactly, but that's exactly my point, that they seem to know a lot more than you're giving them credit for in terms of the relationship between Jews and Poles, if they can identify that person as a Jew. That's my point. Because that's not a white-bearded guy with wearing a black frock, you know, and yeah. had, you know, a Hasidic hat on. That, this person looks like the people around him accept that he has a beard. And no one else does. Anyway. But I am not interested in what they think about Jews. I'm interested in about the role that the Jew plays in the narrative of World War II. Yeah, well maybe. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different question. Let me take a few other answers. Yes, Christine and then Rachel. We'll come. And then so you asked us in the beginning to think more broadly about you know, what this means in other contexts. And so um, I just wanted to hear more about what you think about why in some places it's easier to do this than in others. So mm -hmm. why have they confronted the difficult past in Germany? Why to this day does Japan refuse to acknowledge its war crimes during World War II and, and you know, the rest of Asia insists that they do? And so I just wanted to hear more on that. That's a great question and I would, I would welcome debate on this too. But the first answer sometimes that I think in my head, which I typically don't say out loud, but I will say it out loud because I think it's important to refute my first thought, which is the German, there weren't that many Jews left, so you can face your difficult past when there aren't that many Jews left. But that, that was the same case in Poland, and they didn't face their difficult past, right, in that way. So, of course, there's political context and the communists and repression and so on and so forth. But um, I'm not exactly sure why it's easier is that the word, for some communities to um, incorporate difficult histories into their curriculum and f face it, and for others, it's harder. Um, I, does somebody else have an, uh, an opinion on this? Sure. Yes? It, it wasn't easy. I mean, it yeah. took Germany how long before they started to recognize and to incorporate into their curriculum and to build museums and so forth. I mean, it took a good 40, uh, 40 years. It was the 1980s, right, before there was a significant, you have the historic strife, that, that whole uh, controversy among the German historians about the, the resistance to the idea of normalizing German history, okay, that blew up in the 1980s, okay, so, and, and that, I think, was one of the great triggers for what has followed since that time. What sense was that happened to, yeah? I, I see a similar thing. Just in the way our history is taught, you mentioned Cherokee, and I, I recently <clears throat> taught that. And it, the way history is taught, mostly, it's like, well, that that bastard Andrew Jackson, he's the one. Mm -hmm. You know, he defied the Supreme Court, and so it's his fault. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that, and then we're all off the hook. Mm -hmm. And what I would try to point out is why I insist on teaching the Constitution. I said, okay, there's checks and balances here. What should have happened? Mm -hmm. And then they go, well, he should have been impeached. <laughs> and then you ask, well, why wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Because they agreed. The House of Representatives agreed. All the people who saw the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears, they knew this is a, that the Supreme Court had ruled in their favor. They similarly said nothing. But today we get to blame Andrew Jackson. There's and also we, an issue of plunder there, right? Right. If you admit to some of this, you have to give back land, give back mm -hmm. territory, give back homes, give back art, and, give back and so we, the homes got, that people we live blame, in. We've got to blame someone. So this is those damn Nazis. Yes. Now it's Andrew Jackson. Get him off the $20 bill. It's his fault. And then we're off the hook. And I see it's the same thing. We don't have to face the fact Andrew Jackson is merely implementing the will of the people. Mm -hmm. This is on all of us. I think, um, which one would you think? Well, there's a struggle over these, these ideas, though, that uh, there was a tremendous pressure on the Germans, including Nuremberg trials, etc., even beyond blaming somebody. Yeah. That, that in fact, there was a tremendous amount of evidence put before the world right after the war yes. that this had happened and this they had done this. Who did it? Who participated? Yeah, that right. became an issue later on. There's no question that they had done this as well. I, what other country in Europe? I mean, Poland's the only country that hasn't agreed to, to give back stuff. But, but, there's no other country. Look what the French went through. With, uh, so many years later, still not resolved uh, about what happened in France. I don't mean the Dutch. The percentage of Dutch Jews who were yeah. killed in the war was the same as in Poland. Yeah. Okay, Dutch have never sat down and said, how did this happen? Who turned in people? A lot of people turned in people. In it. So the thing with the money in Switzerland, when did that happen? That happened just 10 years ago. Okay, Swiss is clean, right? So I, I think Poland has a particular situation because of the reparations issue. But the fact is, and the Poles have been very adamant that we're the victims, right? So it's a different position. But the fact is that European countries in general have not dealt with this issue. I mean, you're right. They don't want to deal with the past and what they did. It's a tough. It's tough. It changes what we think about ourselves. Right? Of yourselves. Yes. How you characterize yourselves. As I, absolutely. So let's take a few more. Yes, um, Rebecca and Sarah, and then Sam. Yes, I'd just be curious to hear you comment on. I don't remember how recent that Poland's recent law about. Yeah, I don't remember the exact wording of it, but that seems to fit precisely per perfectly. Yeah. yeah. So they 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 recently rescinded the law. Mm -hmm. uh, they went back on it. They did in a kind of secret nighttime vote to not upset their base, basically. But. Um, <laughs> There was a huge international outcry against it. And what was the law? It, it was, um, I forget now what it's called too, it was basically if you at all publicly said, taught, or included materials that would imply that <laughs> Poles were involved in Nazi crimes, or if you said something like Polish concentration camps versus Nazi concentration camps on Polish soil, there were certain like strings of words that were basically deemed illegal and you could be fined for them. They even said you could be put in jail. I don't think they fined a certain for anybody, and I don't think they put anybody in jail. Um, but there are a couple of people who are on trial right now because of their academic work that, um, well, the trials are now stopped and forgiven because the law was repassed, but there were a few trials that came up with historians who had talked about Polish publicity. So, you know, it's a government thing. They, they, once they get out of power, <laughs> they're just like a little bit more fascist. And so they'll, I think that their time is tr trickling out, is my sense from the last election. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to the facing history question. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've done a ton of work with facing history. I'm not part of oh, facing good. history, so but, so, yeah. but I, I do know a lot about kind of how they do their work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably not fair to say that they don't um, look at the students. Um, I think that they do provide materials for teachers. 
and they do do lots of in-service with teachers, but like lots of organizations that do in-service with teachers, it's really hard to follow into the classroom exactly how the, and, and it's, yeah. it's incredibly varied in, in my experience how basic history gets taken up by teachers. So your research is incredibly valuable in that context because you do have insights into a lot of the issues that I think they care about. So it, it feels like there could be a lot of synergy there. That would be great. Yeah. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah. Because it seems like a natural connection. Yeah. Um, so my, it's interesting, the question I have actually has a connection to Facing History, but I only just realized. Uh, facing History until more recently, Jan Darsa's kind of emendation of some of this work. But, yeah. um, so uh, a historian of the Holocaust, Yehuda Bayer, said that um, it was nothing that the Nazis did that was innovative except for technological efficiency. Mm -hmm. That everything that we see everything that we saw in the Holocaust had historical precedent yeah. in Europe. And so my, it seems like what you're asking here when you're asking the Poles to address the difficult history, you're, you're asking about what role was their complicity in ridding <coughs> their country of Jews. And I want to ask you, is, is that really the most difficult history? Or is the most difficult history, and I, I want your opinion, Yeah. the history of Christianity in Europe? Mm -hmm. What Christianity? That that, that is, yeah. that is, in the same way that facing history for close to 30 years of its existence, avoided this question. Yeah. It was all about bystanders, but never about the Christian, the kind of thing that we find in Rosemary Ruther, the Christian yes. theologians That's right. who dealt this that yeah. the you difficult history saying, yeah. is taking the book of John yeah. and saying the broken branch of the synagogue needs to be burned, which of course was the, the, the proof text for an auto de fe in the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, so I think that an even more difficult history than Polish complicity would be uh, I'm sure there are books on this written. In fact, I know of one, but one that was actually picked up or something would be teaching about the role of the church in the murder of Polish Jews. Not only that, but literally, physically, the role of the church building. Yeah. That priests, I don't know why, and I, I wonder why, allowed locals to burn Jews in churches as a place to burn it down. And it's not even so Yedvabne is a barn, but there are many cases, like my family, um, Otto and his Christian wife and children were burned in churches. And so there's, like, I'm not, you know, maybe maybe it was a barn-like structure in a poor town, I mean, who knows. But I do believe that that would be, not to put um, levels of difficulty on human tragedy, but that would probably be met with even more resolve against it. Yeah. So um, my dad who you know, lived at, uh, at that time he was in a labor camp, not a, not a extermination camp. <clears throat> and um, for different reasons he you know, didn't, was not a scholar but a self-made historian. And um, he actually, uh, when he passed, I had about at least a hundred books about um, anti-Semitism and the war, mm -hmm. and and um, <clears throat> what I remember him saying uh, is that the Holocaust was no different than what happened to the Jews in the Middle Ages. That's exactly the point that you said. That and he always also and I really don't know whether that's historically true or not, but <clears throat> anecdotal it is. He pointed out that Catholic states, yes. Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, um, parts of Germany, the south more so than the north, the south of Netherlands more so than the north. Um, were much more anti-Semitic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and much more collaborative with the occupation. It's a blood so, libel. Yes, yeah. because and what he said to me was, because as you know, I went to school where um, you know, very few years after the war. Don't figure out how. <laughs> um, uh, preschool. <laughs> Literally preschool. Yes. <laughs> after the war, um, and it was a German school, uh, and I was the only Jewish kid in that school, not in Germany, but. <clears throat> and my dad would say to me, all these friends, I just want you to know that every Sunday when they go to catechism, what they hear is, mm -hmm. look what the yes, Jews did right. to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and that's why, you know, I make my friends very upset uh, when I say that, but I'm not surprised by Jews will not replace us in North Carolina. Charlottesville. Charlottesville. I'm totally not surprised by that. And I know, I just know that everybody's anti Semitic. It's in my DNA. And I don't have to prove it. They have to prove it to me they're not. But um, it's just in my DNA. Famously, the post -war, some of the post-war pogroms, well, at the very least, the Kelsa pogrom was because, well, well, this is, you know, supposedly because a little boy went missing, a little Christian right. boy went missing right. for a few days. He came right. back and he said to his mom, you know, his mom was like, where were you? And he, and he was like, I was up at, the, sort of like saying, I was up at the witch's house and she boiled me in a cauldron. He said, basically, I was like up at the Jew's house where they were using me in a basement for sacrificial something or other. Right. I can't remember the exact details right. now of that particular story. So right. it is, it's ingrained, it's interwoven. Right. Judas, you know, right. the Jews, the Jews betrayed Christ. They right. sacrificed Christian children. I mean, and it sounds so mystical and bizarre, but it, it really is something that if it's built into your, if it's built into your schematic, it's hard to break out of. And so yeah. I just want to add something, another and the other is that when we started to work in middle schools with complex instruction and asked the teachers, so what's the most difficult topic that yeah. you know, we're starting and developing curriculum? Uh -huh. And they said the Crusades. Oh, because so our first unit is about the Crusades, seventh grade history. Mm -hmm. It's and why did they say it was difficult? Because it was Christian. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, a famous, come off the <laughs> there's a famous diary of a French monk who was at the, at the um, siege of Tyre describes how the crusaders uh, said to the people, let, we'll let, you know, let us in and we'll spare everybody. And as soon as they let them in, they murdered uh, everybody and ate children because they were hungry. They cooked the children and ate them. So there's this famous diary. How accurate it is is in dispute, but it is it was on the front page of the lawn when I was there oh, once well. one time, so you can pick it up. I'll pick it it's up. a very famous story. I, I, and Lee, I think have one more question. Yeah. Did you have a Yeah, just running parallel to yeah. history curriculum in all schools is a literature curriculum. Yes. Uh, fiction, drama. <coughs> and the, uh, that curriculum can be very difficult That's right. in a variety of the ways that you That's right. associate with the term with history. And with apologies for asking about a study you aren't doing. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> but do you have some speculations or might you have the good fortune of having yes. a collaborator somewhere who might be looking at the treatment of difficult literature mm -hmm. or drama? Uh, with similar populations and with similar themes? So I don't know of a study, but I do remember what they read at that time, at the very least. So they have their own kind of night, basically, or their own Anne Frank. It's a, it's a, a Polish boy, I believe, in his diary um, that a, a lot of the Polish children read. And they also read another book, which is of Christian Polish man looking 
at the Jews. It's called This Way to the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, where um, he has written, it's quite beautiful, it's very short, and they teach it in the high school, where he has written, sorry, he's written about his own experience in Auschwitz among it, so kind of it helps the Poles get into it. It's like a Polish Auschwitz work camp person who sees, um, who is seeing and engaged in the death camps in some way. Um, this way to the gas, ladies and gentlemen, Kanoš Borowski, I think. Um, so I do know that they engage with it, but it, it brings up an, it brings up something uh, that I read yesterday, thanks to Sam. But you know, I think that it's almost easier for students to, so to speak, deal with like dead Jews and heroic poles than it is to deal with um, dead Jews and like not only unheroic poles, but possibly, you know, your sort of ancestral line. <laughs> Uh, because a lot of people have things like silver in their house that the story goes, um, and this was in my previous study, that the story goes like, we got this for hiding a Jew. But once you learn about what really happened, you realize that the silver that they have in their house, or whatever it is, is really a bribe that they probably took and probably also gave up. You know, I mean, if everybody who said they saved a Jew saved a Jew, at the very least another million Jews would have been alive in Poland. So... Um, so I think there is treatment of, of kind of, uh, there is treatment in the literature, but again, it's, it's easier maybe than Polish But those poetry. are the yeah. examples of literature, that, the examples you've given. That's literature that purports to represent things that actually happen. That's right. Yeah. Through the eyes of Poles, perhaps. That's right. That's right. I'm talking about novels, The Last oh. of the Just. I mean, yeah. novels that are clearly might fiction in mm -hmm. some ways, afford an easier entry to the difficulties presented because we know that identity is also formed from the study of literature and yeah. from watching plays. And well, who is it, the Baudrillard or something says that it's easier for folks to understand something through like a simulacrum, so something that is unreal, which is why folks like Mouse, Mouse is not fiction, it's a comic novel for those of you that don't yeah. know, but for some reason, Mouse is able to teach people about the Holocaust in right. ways a book written of his father's wouldn't. So yeah. I can, that's a great point. 